Hello folks, my name is Jim Worthen. The show is Worthen One-on-One. -on -One. We're here on Cox Cable Channel 17 in the uh, uh, coast of uh, Central California. Uh, we're on every Friday night at 7 p.m. and then every weekday at 2 p.m. on Channel 17. But as my jazz-loving brother used to say, that's just the first verse. Uh, we are on TVSB's website. Go to the demand list and go to the bottom of the list. Uh, I don't know why I'm the last person on the list, but you'll find more than one on one. And if you hear about the show, but you're not on uh, Cox uh, uh, Channel 17, you can go to YouTube and search one on one and uh, you'll find us there forever as my wonderful granddaughter says daddy you you know that you're on the internet you'll be there forever i said yeah isn't that wonderful she said no it just means that your great 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 granddaughter 200 years from now will be just as embarrassed as i am she says she didn't say that that i made it up but it's my attempt at humor. Um, my show today is back to politics. We've gone through a lot of uh, religious shows. It had something to do with uh, Easter and the churches and the resurrection. And uh, we've had Protestants and uh, Father Bob from the Greek Orthodox Church. So now we're back to politics. And I'll try and not have every show be political between now and November of 24, but I bet more than half, oh wait, two weeks, Bill Pintard will be in talking about the forester, see? So I'm not a one-tune pony. Is that the term, one-tune pony? Uh, my guest today is a, a gentleman that I've known probably at least six or eight years and we'll get to where I first met him. Uh, he's a political analyst and writer and spends a lot of time thinking about it, which that scares me, thinking about politics. And Anyway, uh, Tom Cole, how are you? Good, Jim, thank you. Glad to be here. Well, every show starts out, I keep telling jokes, but I can't resist them. Every show starts out where were you born, Tom? Now that confused Joe and Bill. <laughs> Where were you born, Tom? I was born in uh, Los Angeles, right near USC. My parents were in school and I just popped out during that time. So right there in the Linwood area. And uh, go, did you grow up there? And that was 66 years ago. And no, we didn't grow up there at all. I basically grew up in Sherman Oaks. Uh, the parents moved up, moved out, and got into Sherman Oaks up there in the hills. And uh, I, I went to high school and junior high there and also uh, elementary schools. All out in the valley, Sherman. In the valley, yes. Yeah. And a wonderful time there. It was, wasn't as, uh, uh, LA overall wasn't as uh, disrupted and gang related. and. I Crime. just remember it as being uh, open, plenty of room, uh, you know, going to the radio shack on the corner and, and buying components to build devices. I was very interested in electronics as a young person, uh, but uh, the, it was a great time. I loved growing up there. I can't imagine where else I would have grown up as a city fellow. It really gives you a city vibe. It, you ride your bicycle around the neighborhood? Everywhere. And, yeah. I mean, everywhere, yeah. And, did you have a bicycle gang, a bunch of guys that, and gals that you rode around oh, with? Oh yeah, I mean at 10, I still, I got out on the stingrays. That was a big thing in those days, uh, in the 60s, late 60s. Um, but, you know, earlier than that, I was still in the valley and uh, our family is musical. My father is a conductor of orchestras and mom was a, was a piano player and uh, they both taught music school in high school for a while in the early days. Um, but I started out playing violin when I was four years old. Wow. 
Wow. I, I mean, I remember it too. I was like, this high, here's the tiniest violin you've ever seen. And they said, okay, here you go, start in, here's your lessons. And it was three days a week for, for eight years. You got sucked into child concerts? That, that uh, I, did, I did some playing, some orchestral playing. They, they had visions that I would be, you know, at the next Mozart, <laughs> as most parents that are musical. They thought, oh, we're going to give him the best lessons. And, and I did practice a lot, got really good, and, but the pressure was a lot. There was a lot of pressure. As I became 10, I said, oh, I, gotta, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Everyone's out doing things, and I'm three hours a day. So it wasn't my thing, and I think I moved on as a young person, but I, I really learned discipline. Uh -huh. I noticed a lot of people don't have discipline. They can't do anything for more than 10 minutes. I can do something for like three hours, and it's not a problem for me. I can sit down at a, at a, on, a, on a laptop and work on a, you know, analyzing some data for three hours, not a problem. So I, I think it developed that skill, yeah. which is, is not always uh, prevalent today. Yeah. Discipline and concentration comes from playing musical instruments. Now, you said your father was a... A conductor, yes. yes he, uh, he ended up going to conducting school and working his way up, and ultimately he was doing concerts at the uh, Music Center in Los Angeles, and he actually got a job uh, full-time at Buffalo uh, Sym Symphony. Wow. And so I, I did spend a year in Buffalo, uh, actually out of Buffalo, in a small town outside of Buffalo uh, for a year, my last year of, uh, of high school. When you were in high school? Yeah, yeah, so I did have a little journey. And what was your, uh, was your mother a stay-at-home mother or was she a... Uh, in Mom was stay-at-home, but then she got into teaching as well because it was a great income in those yeah. days. You could teach and could have two parents and a huge house at the pool in the valley. And so she was a teacher as well, and she played piano and other instruments. Um, my dad is still living. Mom's passed away about 20 years ago, but dad's still living. He's 95, I think it is. Does he live here in town? He lives in Berkeley. He's a, he worked there for the last 20 years of his working career as a presenter at Cal Berkeley. A presenter. And that's the person that brings in the act. So he brought in Baruchnikov, Paul McCartney, this, you know, Grateful Dead, everybody, to play at the various venues at Cal Berkeley. So we, we had a lot of concerts, a lot of free shows, and it was a, a great time to see uh, Alvin Alley, the dance troops, and he actually did some conducting in those later years uh, for various acts that would come in and they need a conductor. He would be ready to do that. I'd love to ask him about a man I was introduced to by my brother who was loved jazz. Uh, Dr. Lewis Gottlieb, who became the leader of the Limelighters and went off, I mean, he'd been in Juliet and up in teaching and learning music, but he led one of the uh, two big uh, kind of folk groups, Kingston Trio and the Limelighters. Those are big, yes. Yeah. and. Uh, so uh, well, Robert, you know, Cole is, is his name, and he's uh, still he's retired now. He lives in the hills above Berkeley, and he gets to the gym three times a week. Wow! I don't know how he does it. Uh, he drives to the gym, and he plays concertos with his friends on the front porch. Now he plays viola. Well, you know, 90, so he, 90 is the new fifty. That's know? right. He's just a spring chicken. Right. And I always make the joke to him. I said, Dad, you know you know why viola is better than violin? And he says, no, I don't know. And I said, well, because the viola burns longer. <laughs> See that? I get him every time. He goes, oh, I know that one. Dude. Well, you uh, uh, come from a great musical heritage. And your, uh, when your mother taught, was she teaching music also? Yeah, she taught music and played uh, piano in some of the orchestra gigs that, that dad would get. And I, great. I have lots of memories of... Uh, being 10 and then dad would have the scores all over the living room and we'd you know arrange all the parts have to be put together and we would drive to the um, Hollywood Bowl on a Saturday and the freeways were deserted and we'd go a hundred out to Hollywood Bowl he'd pick up a, a score which would be like this big all the parts for all the players take it home arrange it and then he would go out and do a gig somewhere as a conductor, so it was a it was a living, and then eventually turned into a full time job for him. Oh. 
And, wow. and he, they still fly him to St. Petersburg and to Singapore to do uh, concerts. St. So Petersburg, Russia. Russia. This was years. Not Florida. Not <laughs> recently, yeah, but he, they fly him all over the world uh, to do concerts and conduct because apparently American conductors are really big outside of America. Here they're like, ah. Yeah, here we we get an Israeli uh, or we want a, a foreigner. <laughs> so that, that's what yeah, that's what my dad says. Yeah, they just want the foreigners. So he he does that, and uh, but um, I see him a couple times a year. We get up there and visit. There's a lot of wisdom in the Bible. It's something about being not being a prophet in your own land. <laughs> yes, that's right. But he uh, but that was I got a lot of musical training and and just the whole idea of discipline and uh, reading music. And I, I did go on to play jazz guitar later, because I switched, I switched over to guitar. So I did guitar for probably from 10 to 22, practicing three, four, five hours a day many times for years on end. I ended up being in stage bands and ended up writing uh, stage band pieces. So I ended up writing because that, that seemed more better than just being, look at me how good I am. I could write parts for everybody and have them play what I had heard and I'd work it out in the piano. And so I was writing scores at, at 20 when I was in a junior college for stage band. And so a big musical career, you know, already done by 22, I was over, yeah. over all that. So folks, you now know why every show, friends, I remember when a sister once said to her brother after a show, I didn't know that about you. Now you're hearing things that many people that know Tom had no idea about. And people ask me why I have this long uh, biographical sketch at the beginning of uh, uh, my shows. The reason is it characterizes what the person is going to say in what they thought they were here for. Well, we'll get to that. Yes. It's politics. So. Um, your, um, where did you go to high school? Was that in Lock and uh, I went to the uh, high schools in Sherman Oaks, mm -hmm. spent a year at Venice High, which was pretty much different from Sherman Oaks. Yeah. It was very multiracial in those days, it still is. Uh, so I went there for a year, and then I went to high school in uh, uh, New York, upstate New York, outside of Buffalo for a year. I went to a city college in Northern California. Where? Uh, Humboldt. Humboldt. Yeah, yeah, I went up there. I wanted to get away from the city. So that was as far as you could go without leaving California, actually. You're 90 yeah. miles from the border up there. So yeah, I went to city college there and uh, that's where I did all the stage band work. And I had got in on a music, uh, not a music scholarship, but a swimming scholarship because I was a swimmer. So I could do the 200-yard uh, races in you know under two and a half minutes. So wow. I got in uh, to the school and did a lot of music work there, and got like a, a degree from that school. Yeah. We'll get back to the swimming. Oh, you, yeah. you you didn't uh, win any women's races, did you? <laughs> women's we'll races. Yeah, that. I, <laughs> I might have done better if I could have <laughs> transferred over. Yeah. Um, so uh, after. College, uh, City College, did you go on to, I know you got a law degree, what? Uh... I, went, I went into, um, I went back to Los Angeles and kept working in the music business for a while and then I also started working uh, as a contractor and a builder. I ended up flipping houses, I was building and flipping and moving along pretty well in Los Angeles in those days. You could easily make a good living and, and uh, done that for maybe another 20, 20 years, I think, of, of developing, and, and uh, that left me pretty much with uh, properties that I have now, rental properties that I, you know, sa saving grace, because that's my retirement at this point, and I can, you know, say that I'm retired. Uh, I came up to Santa Barbara in 90, and uh, found it, you know, very relaxing to get out of the traffic of Los Angeles and the crime, and it was a a whole different thing. This was like a country escape up here. And I remembered back in the, in the 60s, my father would bring us up here and he would do shows at the Granada. And we thought it was like going to Disneyland, horses up in the hills, people with stables, and we'd go to parties and 
see these big spreads up in the hills with the, the barns. So this was, a, I already had been here uh, several times and remember driving up many times on the freeway in the 60s and a one lane road with stop signs all the way through Oxnard and Camarillo, the stop sign here in town, right. uh, in no freeways, no crowds, it was, it was something. So I, I came back here in the 90s because I liked it. And uh, at that point I, I thought, well, I, I need more of education. And there was a law school, night school, so I went to uh, the Southern California Institute of Law. And our dean there was uh, Dean uh, Stanislas Poulet, uh, Sri Lankan, who had a PhD from King's College in England, and he opened his own law school here, and so I went there for four years and uh, picked up the 84 units and, and got a law degree in 2000. So it really helped because I was great at reading, but d d disorganized, and when you go through law school, you learned everything from corporations, criminal law, torts, contract law, um, constitutional law. So there's 13 different topics that you learn and they're all interconnected so that you can spot crimes and spot carryovers from one topic to another, four topics at a time sometimes. So it really broadens you know, the mind in that way and the discipline of just having to learn 13 topics and be able to write an essay in you know, 30 minutes. So well, that, that was a good skill and certainly most people in Congress, many, many, are lawyers because that's what Congress is all about. Writing laws, understanding laws, um, reading them and being able to talk about them and decide whether they're a good law or a bad law. So. Yeah, I, uh, when I worked for the state senate I was a legislative assistant and in my businesses and uh, occupation I always had to deal with lawyers and uh, there's a, there's a few as smart as me. Uh. <laughs> Sometimes they're very smart, but they can't figure anything out. No common because sense. Because they have no common sense. They haven't done the other things that most people do uh, you know, during their lives. Lawyers usually are done by 23 and 4 there. They've done nothing else. Now, did you ever practice in courtroom and... Uh, no, no, not a practicing attorney. So I, I managed to avoid that. You, so I, I didn't need to, so I, I... So you never got admitted to the bar? No. Yeah. I took the bar exam, though. That's a tough exam, I'll tell you. Yeah. Woo. Uh, but I enjoyed it. I got very close, unfortunately. Uh, now, uh, but now I have the ability to read and write like nobody's business. And in fact, being a writer in music business, it gave me even more impetus to write freely and not feel like I'm constrained like a lawyer trying to write for a judge. I feel more that I'm writing for uh, uh, people that are working and trying to live their lives without having to say, oh, this is a law that you must obey. No, how about, does this law help you? And usually it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Usually it doesn't because I look at so many government bills, like I looked at all the ones <laughs> That, for instance, uh, um, the candidate in, that I'm running against, perhaps, uh, very few of them are useful. It's like a piling on of paper and paperwork, and so there's, that gets into my, my, some of my theories that there's too much government, yeah. just to start with. When, we, uh, when I was in Sacramento with then-Senator Bob Lugger-Marcino as legislative assistant, we passed a ton of laws. The reason was that was 66, between 60 and 66, <coughs> the crazy activist U.S. Supreme Court wiped out pornography laws, wiped out capital punishment. I mean, just, there were so many, but they would give guidelines so we would have to write a law to replace the laws they had wiped out. The Rehnquist Court. Yeah. Yeah, that was a rough time for it was great for liberals, I guess, but look what they've created now. Yeah. We're trying to pull it back, and you were doing the same. Um, so um, you married at some point. Where did you find your wife? Uh, first wife I found at school, uh, at a college, and uh, that, that went pretty well. We have a nice son from that. Uh, 
marriage, and now I'm a you yes. have a son. A one son. That's your uh, only. That's uh, the child. only one. Yeah, we'll yeah. get to him in a minute. Okay. Yeah. Just a minute. Uh, so that marriage ended. Have you remarried? Or? Remarried now. Yes. Yeah. Living so, in Montecito. Do you very hide? Happy. Do you hide her from me? She doesn't like crowds, but you could meet her someday. <laughs> I'll bring her out. So you have a son. That's where I think I really first met you. Um, we, as a Republican Party, were always recruiting somebody to run against a Democrat. We do that even in a race that's a suicide race because running against a Democrat pins down that money that might go somewhere else to help a Democrat that we can defeat. And so uh, your son, Charlie, stepped up to run for the assembly. Tell us how that came about and tell us about Charlie. Right, I think it, at that time it was, uh, he was three years younger, he was 23 then, and that was 2019 or so. And anyway, I think we were at a party with uh, a fundraising party with Andy Caldwell mm -hmm. over at Lad, Lad's place up in the hill there, packed house, and we were talking with our friend James Fankner. He came over and he had heard some rumblings that they needed a candidate, and so he actually came up with the idea. He said, you know, Charles should run. What's he doing? You know, he's in between events with college, and so we, we took the idea to uh, to Bobby, I think it was, and, uh, and it seemed to work, and there was no one else running at the time, so it was quite a challenge for a young man. I know it was a lot of pressure. Well, he was in a race uh, thing. We have that jungle primary where the top two go forward. Right, that was so, that was so interesting. That was more exciting than the, than the well, final race because he, we had all these people. We had Kathy Morello running, uh, Dominguez, we had like six other people running uh, along with Steve Bennett who ultimately won. But get this, in the primary, uh, Charles came in first. Yeah. And Bennett came in second, which was hilarious. And Marilla was kicked out. She yeah. came in third. We forever owe a debt of gratitude, a debt of gratitude to, to Charlie to Cole Carl. for ending Marilla's oh, career. <laughs> that's right, we're, we're glad to take that as a accolade because, uh, you know, I think, if she had won, I think she would have won the seat from, from Bennett, because Bennett and her would have been close. And so I guess it's a, a good thing, because she would have gone on to God knows what, and worse things than Bennett's doing even. Oh, but way. Bennett, she, Bennett was a moderate compared to the uh, what, comp, comp, what Kathy, Kathy would have done, yeah. yeah. So um, that was so interesting, though. That was a fun time. Uh, it really was exciting. Campaigns are exciting. Uh, and, and to win a primary, you know, on Beyond the News, the whole, the whole works. It was very exciting for a small town. Yeah, so Charlie became the uh, front runner yeah, <laughs> in, was, in votes, uh, but uh, he became the, one of the five that went forward. Uh, he, uh, he and Bennett was the other one of the f people that went forward. Right, it was him and Bennett went forward. Yeah. and. Uh, you know, interestingly, we, we watched uh, the, the numbers on that primary, and this is, goes to election integrity. I'll just veer off here because I want to tell somebody about this. We watched Kathy Morello's numbers, and for 34 days after the election, her numbers kept climbing and climbing. And we're going, what the? Nobody else was climbing. You know, the other candidates, we and, and Bennett were going up like three, four percent. 34 days. Holland was still waiting. Where is it, what's going on with this thing? He said, we gotta wait, we gotta wait, because we, you know, we gotta get all these votes in. Mail-in ballots. And, and Merlo was going up, and she was actually getting close, closer. So uh, she almost knocked out Bennett, but they finally gave up. I mean, it's, uh, the election board decided it's time to call the race. The, we have no power over these things. So I just wanted to point out, that looked suspicious. Yeah, that's one of the conflicts in our law, the, uh, the timing really is controlled by state law, not by the local superintendent of, uh, like, in the two counties, and the two separate counties where the uh, uh, clerk is, or 
different and elected. And with and this was the first time with the mail-in ballots and the and, and it was voting month. And so there was not a set standard of how long. Apparently it was up to our voting, our people here, how long they felt like was fair to count these ballots that were floating around out there. But uh, I, I have to say that I think, you know, this is not right. I think voting day is, is the best thing. And just to get it off, paper ballots is the best thing. And, if, you know, while we're on this topic, I'm thinking a paper ballot, voting day, you sign that ballot. And right next to your signature is a barcode. It says who you are. You go in, you pro show your ID, you get your ballot, you sign it. That signature stays on your ballot. That's what I would propose. Because when they do it the way it is now, of course, you know, you sign the outside of the ballot, the, the sleeve. And when it goes into the election office, they take that sleeve, throw it away, and it's never connected to that ballot again. So there's no way to really verify who voted, what, you know, and so this is why I say, put the signature on the ballot. Well, that destroys the secrecy of the ballot. How can I tell Tom Cole I'm voting for him and vote for salute? No one's gonna look at those ballots. They're gonna stay in the election office and they have uh, barcodes which can be fed into machines which can strip out the name. But what we need is that signature on that ballot with the barcode and make sure that signature is who it's supposed oh, yeah. to be. Now we don't really know. We have a separated uh, sleeves that just get thrown away once they're, and, the, and the, the signature verification numbers can simply be turned down or off. And so these are things that, that shouldn't happen. We should, so that's my little bit on integrity. Yeah. Um, so Charlie uh, uh, was defeated by Bennett, but as I recall, he ran ahead of registration, which is always what a Republican aims for that uh, he, you cut into the decline of states and uh, marginal Democrats. Um, what's he doing now? Uh, city College, uh, business law, accounting, English, the usual, he's going for a PhD, he says. We'll see how that goes, but I hope, I hope it works out. He's been doing very well, and we, we just hope he continues. He, he's around. He was around before you got more active. Uh, he, all of a sudden, uh, I think you were traveling, and uh, I think you have a second house up in the Sierras, and he uh, would disappear. And then uh, you wouldn't be around, but he'd appear at a function like the Young Americans for Freedom or uh, something like that. Right, he was like the coal ambassador, and he, he was sent down from our, our northern base to, to represent our area. I'm gone sometimes in the summer doing my business up north, but uh, he's certainly um, back here a lot, and I'm here most of the year also in Montecito. So, uh, as they say, the uh, acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. He's, he's a nice guy, that must say something about the tree. Do you know the tree? The tree, yeah. <laughs> the tree. Well, there's a nice side. There's a nice side, but it's. I think part of it, you know, is my my makeup is like looking at my father as a conductor. You have to get along with 50 people, and they're all musicians. Now, how that's not going to be easy, because if you know musicians, they're very droll. Their strange sense of humor. You know, they have quirks and things like this. But as a, you know, I've seen, you have to get along with people. And, and from working in, in music and all the things that I've done in music, which, no, I wasn't a conductor, but you're in a band, for instance, I've done some work like that. You get to know people and you're really close with them and it's egos. And you have to figure out how to make the band work. You have to figure out how to get the orchestra to work. And so I think this is a, a good point where it may be seen, well, I'm, I'm nice. Well, I wanna get what I wanna get. And then there's a way to do it. It's not by stabbing people. <laughs> it's by finding out what they want and finding a middle ground. Exactly. And I believe that really is, is, is really what our, uh, Republicans in California need to do. Because, I mean, at this point, we're, we're down. Can we go into numbers or 
is this a time to do that? Because I'm ready to, to go into those things. Um, so now, uh, what, I'm going to characterize what I've heard from you mm. and other people. You're very concerned about our present congressperson and the uh, government in general in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, so you're feeling of the ideas of who would be best to take on the rubber stamp salute, and you're saying, I'll do it, but I think I've also heard if somebody better comes along, it's, I'm not in, in this for an ego trip. That, that is true. I'm offering myself up because I have ideas which I am convinced are going to be useful. It's not like no one else has thought of these ideas, but I want to put out how I would run and the issues I would run on. And if someone comes along that's, you know, rich and famous, I'm just running on my good looks. But if rich and famous comes along, let's talk. I, I'm starting early because I want to get in there early and make a noise and make a, a statement of my ideas how to bring the Republicans back to a winning race because we don't want to be at 25, 28 percent in the legislature. So I, I've looked at the numbers closely and in the 24th district and I, you know, I can start off right there because that's Salute Carpacol's district. Is the twenty yeah. fourth? He's been there a long time. Uh, we've had uh, the Fareed campaign against him, and before that was, um, well, actually that was Fareed, and then it was Andy Caldwell ran in twenty twenty, and then, and then we had Doctor Allen yeah. in twenty two, and Caps was the. Uh, Congresswoman before, and we had Tom Watson run. It, it was the Republicans, I think, got the idea that really it wasn't the candidate; uh, it was the characterization of the issues. But it was also that was because there was a twenty percent uh, spread in registration. But Republican, as I analyzed the candidates who ran. They got caught up on what they thought the issues were only, rather than listening to the people and characterizing their uh, campaign on what they're hearing at the grassroots. Right, right. That's that's what I'm looking at is the MPPs. They're out there, and some of them are former GOP that said, okay, I can't take this GOP. There's a certain issue about the GOP that they don't like, so they're going to say, I'm going to be an NPP and sit here in the middle. Decline the state. Around. NPPs, yeah, no party preference. Yeah. And they're sitting there, and, and in the 24th, it's about 26% NPP. And then the Republicans are like 25%. Democrats are over there like 49%. So... This is how uh, the Democrats have been getting uh, 60s and we've been getting 40s. We, we've been splitting that NPP vote. And so uh, Charles and I started this two and a half, three years ago. We started looking at the numbers and going, well, look at this district. There's no wonder that we're not winning because the NPPs, we have to find a way to get to them. Because uh, we're not going to say, hey, Democrats, you should vote for us. Well, of course, that's not going to work. I'm nice, vote for me. No, they have salute, they're happy for the most part. But now in our present uh, commutation that we've come up with, with these numbers, we're finding that we need to get 85% of the NPPs and about 5%, 4% of the Democrats to win. That would give Republicans in the 24th a 51%. So we're looking at right now, Dr. Allen, who just ran against Salud, uh, pulled a 40, and he campaigned not on these issues that I'm talking about here, I'll mention in a minute. He campaigned as a nice guy, a scholar, you know, gentleman, as an, uh, an, you know, an alternate. But I think with some work that he could have pulled that extra 10% out of the NPPs and a little bit out of the Democrats to get a 50. 
So right now the spread, sure you look at it from 40 to 60 is 20 points, but we only need 10 In to the flip. next 25 minutes, I want you to start with <coughs> characterizing Salud. He's such a nice guy and uh, he's uh, been around in government for so long. He's very valuable to the district. You characterize him and then as we go through the issues, you can bring back where he either falls short or can be, the issue can be used against him because of his ties. Right, I, I studied up on, on his history somewhat. He, he's trained as a government employee. He went to government school to study government. So he learned government there. And then his earlier years, of course, as a, an immigrant child in, in Oxnard with parents working in the farms. And then he went to college and got his uh, training and in government. And that was his actual study topic was that of government. Then as a supervisor here for uh, many terms. And I, I would say that when you look at it, Big government is what he knows about. That's what he's been trained to do. Uh, that's what brought him up in the world was big government. Grants to go to college from government. Then he gets into the supervisor position, getting paid by government to do government work, to expand government. Because what else do they do if they're not going to be writing new laws and new bills and new taxes? What good is a supervisor? There's yeah. not much to supervise, so that's what I understand from him up to the supervisor point. And then... Well, before you go ahead, yes. also he went from being a staffer to being the executive assistant to the supervisor, then replacing her. So he was always in that, what you're describing, but there was never a break where he went off and taught even, or went off and did something where he signed the front of a check. So right, he hasn't signed a check. That's always a, a hard one to get around because most Democrats, many Democrats are not business owners. They're, they're government people. And I look at Salute as being the perfect Democrat. Comes up through school, the Mexican-American success story. He goes, you know, joins the Marines as a, you know, as a, as a not a not fighting Marine, but a, a Marine and more government. Uh, then now he gets into the, uh, into Congress and I'm looking at the bills that he's uh, in, authored and ones that he's signed on. And there are strictly uh, Biden type bills. There are strictly Democrat bills. He's all party line. Now he's pure Democrat all the time. Um, I've got I've got documents from the Democrat Party that are sign sheets, pledge sheets. And these are given to all candidates that run for Democrat office. And the ones I have are from this county. And they require the candidate to agree, yes, I like teen talk, I like this, I like that, I will never do this. And they gotta sign this to get funding. And so I know exactly what all these Democrats have signed and agreed to. It's a very strict protocol that they must adhere to. So it's not hard to figure out how Salud got where he is. He strictly party line. We've got about uh, time to cover three major issues and I know you are focusing on uh, like a knowledge of many issues, but you're focusing on these three. The three issues that I think that the whole point Take of running, one at a time, one at a time, right? Well, one is, the big one is schools, and within the schools is parents. Parents vote, and and we did some studying. We looked at uh, analyzed the Glenn Youngkin race, and this is Virginia I'm, in the Virginia governor uh, just a year and a half ago or so. Uh, now Glenn was losing to Terry McAuliffe a big Democrat, the biggest Democrat in the nation practically, as a governor, Terry was governor. And then in a debate, Terry McAuliffe said, you know, parents should stay out of the school issues. And overnight, Youngkin got 20% of the Democrats, they flipped, and gave him a, like a 12 point lead, because it's 20% of 50, 50-50 yeah. in Virginia. So he got about 10, 11 points, 
suddenly Glenn Youngkin was winning and won. This was in the last three weeks of the, the election. Now, we looked at that. Democrats don't flip on many issues, is what I'm going to contend. They don't flip on gas, <laughs> borders, crime, they, whatever. As long as I get my check, as long as, I get, as long as the roads are paved. But Democrat parents will flip on education issues. And uh, I've been working on this issue in, in Santa Barbara, looking at the education issues. Not just that any of our candidates say that parents should stay out, but I've been looking at the books that are in the schools with the, the drastic pornography in them and the training that uh, students are receiving, even, even seventh graders, sixth graders, first graders are still are getting um, trained in, in CRT, critical race training. And it's a race, racial doctrine that's put upon these first graders. They have no idea what they're learning. But I'm against that. As a Republican, most Republicans are against that. And we think, and I think, that if parents knew what was going on in our schools under Salud's nose, under all the Democrats' noses, they would say, hey, wait a minute. I don't want that for my kid. But the, the issue is hidden. So part of my campaign or other Republicans' campaigns, in my view, should be to tell parents in any way possible, mailings, radio ads, hey, parents, did you know this is in your school? And salute is right behind it. Uh, the parent issues are big. And along with, along with the parent issue is a uh, trans issue. Trans people are now very popular with the Democrats because they're trying to use it to say, oh, well, Republicans hate, you know, hate these people, but we don't. It's simply we don't want them forced upon children. Yeah. And that's what I would that's say. That's where it comes into the schools because they are actually active in the schools. And, uh, right, and, and like I'm looking at the, uh, there was just a bill two weeks ago, a Republican bill in Congress where Salute is working as a congressman. And this bill said, okay, we're gonna say no trans men in the girls' locker rooms in school sports. I mean, is that asking too much? Not a single Democrat voted for it. Salud voted against it. So I'm going to say, Mr. Salud, you have a wife and two daughters, which is not unknown. How could you vote to say, yeah, I, I want to keep the trans men in my daughter's locker room? And so if parents knew that, I believe we could peel off 20% of voters, which would give us 40 plus 10 points, which would get us near a win. That's how I would propose to do it. It's, it's not rocket science, but it is political science. And I think this was one of the biggest issues because it worked for Glenn Youngkin. And I'm, there's a couple other issues I would talk about also. Well, let's, let's finish on this yeah. trance. Uh, the, uh, to be a trance woman, a man who, or a boy who says he's a woman, just says it's just to say it. They don't. It's not like the true transgender people that have been around for sixty or seventy years, who went to Sweden and had an operation, took the hormones. They were willing to completely change their body. Uh, uh, that wasn't anything really new, but it was. It took real commitment to being transgender and now a swimmer you were a swimmer can just say i'm a girl and then win by a hundred yards <laughs> exactly right and that the, the the trans issue today the problem is they're putting it into 13 year old children and for instance if i were in congress i would sign a bill if someone put up a bill that says no surgeries for children no trans surgeries for children. And that means under 18. Yeah. Okay, e even if you want it and your parents want to do it, I'd say no, this is a mutilation. And this issue goes also, uh, spills over into women's rights because uh, we, we find a way to get Democrat women, RF, uh, JFK Democrats, 
women who had gone through the whole um, women's movement, the feminist movement, and now they're faced with allowing trans men into girls' locker rooms. And even JFK, uh, RFK Jr. Is, is running for president now, and he's running on that issue. Keep the trans men out of the locker room. So he knows that there are Democrats that will vote for that issue to keep trans men out of the locker room. And it's, it's that simple. He knows there's going to be votes there. and He may or may not knock out Biden. But the point is, we can use that issue too because we are, we're the original non-trans in, in the ladies' locker rooms. And it's a women's rights issue. So these, the older feminists, the JFK Democrat women, will say, you know what? I don't want salute because I don't want my granddaughter in a locker room with a trans man in school, in a government school. And salute is perfectly fine for it. He voted against it. I don't want to, he, he, him he and all the Democrats. It. Yeah, he, he voted against the ban, which was a Republican bill. So yeah. in, that's, well, that's one big point right there. Salute's going against women's rights. He's going against girls' rights and child's rights and parents' rights. So he doesn't realize he's crossing a lot of lines that, that should lose him a lot of points. You mentioned Youngson's campaign uh, because the parents' rights became so uh, important. We can't ignore the fact that there was a trans boy in, at the very same time in a high school who raped a 14-year-old girl in the bathroom. They moved him to another school where he attempted to rape another girl. That's right. So, you know, big question is what is trance? And uh, if, if it's just what you say it is with no other ramifications, no other action, mm -hmm. it's uh, like uh, fraud. <laughs> right, and what educational purpose is yeah. served by allowing people to wear different clothes? Uh, in fact, I would almost want to say, you know, in government schools in the old days, they had uniforms. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. I would not be against wearing uniforms. You're in a government school, you wear a uniform, so we know who you are, what school you belong to, and if you're a guy, you're not going to wear a dress. There, there's and that would be a solution, like they do that in some private schools. It really should be done in public schools, I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, they do it in some of the big city schools, too, where they have a crime problem. Crime problems. But, yeah. And, okay. and so the thing is, what educational purpose is served by allowing trans people into so locker rooms? None. Here's There's a, no educational purpose. Here's an issue that uh, Salud can't say, I agree with you, because he's down the road with the leftist, the most radical yep. Democrats. Yep, he's locked in. What's the next one? The last issue on schools is, before we leave, our schools in this area, 70% failure rate for academics. Mm -hmm. So with all that going on that we don't like, they still can't graduate people that can balance a checkbook. And so they have no excuse. So, okay, next issue. Next issue is I wanted to get to is energy. Because I think Salute is failing uh, the county uh, by his, you know, his present position, which is pure Democrat idea that oil is going to ruin the earth and we're all going to die. Now, this is hysterical, and many Republicans believe it's hysterical, but it is hysterical laughing. But what's happening is, you know, he's destroyed the oil industry in our county, which used to be a great job. You could be a high school graduate and make 100000 a year as an oil worker in the fields in Santa Maria and, and elsewhere in our big county. Now those jobs are gone. The oil pipeline is not going to be replaced maybe because there's so many regulations against it. And from, from Washington, we have Salud saying, yeah, I'm signing off, no more oil, no exploration, we're going green, all this stuff. But at the same time, California is importing oil from Saudi Arabia, which have no regulations at all. They just pump it out of the ground, if it spills, they just light it on fire. So the point is, there's no real concern for the environment. It's, it's some kind of other method to control people, to destroy jobs in our county. How could a congressman think that's a good idea? Except he's been told, you better toe the line on the environment. We're all gonna die, just keep saying that. And no one has a job. 
people, how, how are people going to live on 17 an hour? You, can't, you can barely get an apartment for that, and that's what's left to people. Uh, the Latino community that we wonder about, salute, do you care about them? Well, he's going to get them, what, welfare checks, or he's going to get them bonuses, or some gas money that he's had a bill. That's not really helping. The government ought to stand out of the way and protect industry so that it can grow. Oil is not a, 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 a destructive industry. It is the industry that made America what it is. The whole courthouse, everything was paid for with oil taxes. Uh, if, if people want to drive their bicycle to their city council meetings and say we should stop oil, well, how are you going to build a house without oil? You need trucks, you need materials, you, everything is... So as, even as our... Uh, uh, so the point is we have to get oil back into the mix. To, to bring our economy back to life. We can't have people just working on farms and living in tiny shacks in Santa Maria and voting for salute. I don't think so. I think when they see that what he's done to our economy, there will be more votes to lose. So that's another issue that I would bring up. He, uh, of course, the Biden administration and uh, is pushing for electric cars and uh, I think they want 60 percent by uh, 2030 to be electric, and uh, there's all sorts of gimmicks, you know, whether it's sales or whether it's total. Of their, they f first were going to do total, but then they realized that people would just be like Cuba and make those beautiful gas-running cars go on forever, repair them, not go to an electric vehicle, right. trying to bribe people. Uh, what do you see is, uh, what about the electrification of our transportation system? You know, when you look at the electric cars, even the, even the Teslas, which are superbly engineered and amazing works, but the point is they use more energy than a F-150. If you go over the lifetime of use and the amount of mining technology that goes into getting the lithium, plus all that lithium from China, plus the U.S. has banned lithium mines in the U.S. Unbelievable. What is going on with that? Salute. Why, why did you sign on to that bill? That's nuts. We, if we're going to do electric, let's get it from here. But the, the point is still an F-50 is more friendly than an electric car. That's, and, and it's by a wide margin. I've seen the studies. And then another point is you get electrification in California. Right now, California is importing energy from other states. We don't have enough energy to run our state right now. And it's like 20%, I mean like what, 5% of our state's electric cars. Uh, with 60% electric cars, there'd be no way. Our grid can't handle it. There's no electric, where are you gonna get it? They're gonna burn coal in Arizona to power California's green revolution. So I would want to point out, if you really look at the numbers, the green revolution, you know, as much as people have been indoctrinated to believe it, there are huge problems with the facts in that case. And uh, I can get into the ice ages where we, where, where we look at things and the whole earth warmed up with no global warming from coal or oil. So when yeah. I think of an electric car, I then begin to shake because three times in my life I've run out of gas. How do you get electricity if you run out of it on the freeway? You got to pull some, over, and, yeah. and six hours later you're on your way. Yeah. So there's a lot of problems, and and just the whole point that it burns up more carbon in an electric car yeah. than a F uh, Ford one fifty. So. There's a little plug so, to Ford, but I'm a Chevy guy, actually. We've got four minutes left. I thought you had one more issue, or was that the woman's rights? I think we've covered the big issues that, that you know, when I look at this, this district, the way to win is to make friends with our NPPs and make friends with the JFK Democrats and even make friends with the hard-ass liberals. But they're not going to vote for us. But the point is, if you can't get votes, you're not running a race that that's making sense and as a builder and designer i like to do things with a plan and look at the data and look at the money and the materials and make sure the whole thing works 
before I even start. Like you're building a house, you gotta have plans, permits, everything. So this is kind of my plans and permits for winning in, in a district. Whoever might run, I may be happy to do it, but it takes support. But I have a plan, and I think this plan will actually work because I, I look at the other candidates that have run in the past, they, they have an idea, they have a hope, but we're looking at dead on numbers and topics that will bring those numbers around. That's, that's how I look at it. Do you think we're, I think, I'm hopeful because of the, what it does for the body politic, but do you think a robust primary for president in both parties will benefit the dialogue that you're talking about or will it bury it? I think it'll be good. It'll bring out more voters. People will be more inclined to vote. And if they're out there looking at the candidates, they're going to see these issues. And they're going to say, why is Salud putting trans men in the locker room? And why is Salud killing the oil business? We got no jobs and oil $6 a gallon or gas for my car. I think they're going to say, well, you know, I could live. Who knows if they're going to vote for Trump or whoever it is on the left side, it may be RFK, but I think it'll be good in general. I'd rather have a presidential year because all the numbers are higher and there's so much more visibility. Yeah, I'm, I'm not concerned. It looked in the beginning like Biden had it wrapped up till all of a sudden there's two candidates that are getting 30% of the vote against him. That could draw in even another major candidate. On the Republican side, we thought that uh, there could be a, re uh, a battle between Trump and DeSantis, but it's, Trump just seems to be going up with every attack on him, and DeSantis isn't going down because, because he's bad. It's just Trump keeps taking more and more of the pie. <laughs> uh, he's a master at, at PR, yeah. isn't he? It's amazing. Well, yeah, but some of his PR is getting prosecuted for things that everybody laughs about. As sad as his loss this week was, uh, you know, something that happened 40 years ago. <laughs> right. Tom, thank you. Anything quick you want to tell people how they, we've been saying how they can reach you? And uh, yes, yeah, certainly check coalitionforliberty.com. So that's coalition, the number four, liberty.com. And read my essays and writings. I'm the real deal. I'm not being told by any consultants what to say or think. And so you'll get that. I try to tell you what to say and you <laughs> just won't do it. I won't listen. <laughs> and I won't shut up either, but I, I want to help. Glad to be here, Jim. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. All right. <laughs>